Sorry. All right, welcome everyone. Um, we are the lead in program with Michigan Disability Rights Coalition. And today we are going to be talking about inclusive employment practices. So the lead in program staff consists of myself, Asian A. Thomas, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am the director of the leadership programs. And I also identify as a black woman with multiple invisible disabilities. Um, my guest speaker today is Tamika. I think I want you to introduce yourself. Yeah, um, my name is Tamika Sitches Bruce. My pronouns she, her, and hers, and I am uh, the lead in director of this program. And also members of our team are Felice Turner, our disability specialist, and Priscilla Cano, who is our bilingual disability advocate. So our mission at Michigan Disability Rights Coalition is that MDRC cultivates disability pride and strengthens the disability movement by recognizing disability as a natural and beautiful part of human diversity while collaborating to dismantle all forms of oppression. And on the slide is an image of the Michigan Disability Rights Coalition logo. So we just want to welcome everyone and thank you all for joining us. Um, we welcome questions, so please feel free to ask questions during our presentation. We will also have time at the end for questions. Um, feel free to unmute, raise your hand, or type in the chat. Um, and also, if you could rename yourself, um, please add your preferred pronouns to your name on your Zoom. Um, this will help our chat moderator. And if you are joining us on Facebook, in order to interact with our um, interpreters and to view the live captioning, you will have to um, register for the training and join us on Zoom. We will not be uh, moderating the Facebook comments. Image on the slide is a question mark. And so for access, we do have an um, ASL interpreter and live captioning being typed. Um, this pre presentation is also being recorded and streaming live on Facebook. We will also upload our presentations to our YouTube channel. Um, and me and Tamika will be doing visual descriptions of the images on the slides. If you miss one, please let us know. Um, we will also send slides and the link to the recording to all that have registered. Uh, the image on the slide is of a uh, person with brown skin and black hair, and they are signing hello. So just a little bit about our program. Um, the Lead In program is the Lead Inclusive Network. Um, it is a program funded by the Michigan Developmental with Disabilities Council, and our program creates a community of practice that includes supporting organizations that primarily serve BIPOC, so Black, Indigenous, people of color, um, communities in uh, providing them services to reach their inclusion goals for people with developmental disabilities. And again, our programs are funded by the Michigan Developmental Disabilities Council. Great. So today we will, um, our agenda for today and what we will be covering. Um, first, we will talk about the benefits of inclusive employment practices and what um, inclusive employment practices are. We'll talk about some barriers that people um, with disabilities face in the workplace. Uh, we'll go into disability justice and the disability justice framework in the workplace. And then we'll also talk about an audit toolkit um, that was created by disability advocates. Um, and we'll talk about that and using that as a tool. And creating an inclusive workplace, we'll talk about a lot of different ways to create and um, implement inclusive practices, and then we'll wrap it up with how to disrupt ableism in the workplace.
So we just have a question um, for you all. So what has employment discrimination felt like for you? So if you have experienced any discrimination within the workplace or an employer, um, what has that felt like for you? And feel free to unmute to share or type in the chat. Tamika, do you have any experience of workplace sorry, discrimination that you wanna share? Um, so as far as uh, discrimination, um well not on not in particular the employment but as far as with uh going to college um I um which you know right after high school and I was um you know trying to you know go to a broadcasting school and they uh the administrators had a meeting with um my mom and I, and essentially said that I could not uh, attend their school, you know, due to their disability, due to my disability. I have a physical, you know, disability where I use a wheelchair. So due to that, I could not go to their broadcasting school. They had a uh, radio and they, um, they had a uh, video. So, um, that was, you know, of course, it's discrimination, and uh, it was, you know, definitely a horrible experience, you know, to be denied to a school. So, and as far as with deployment, it's always being cognizant of, you know, would I be able to get into the building, get, you know, those type of things that I had to be, uh, you know, concerned about in the past. Thank you for sharing. Um, you can go back to the slide. I was, I'm going to share. Uh, so I would say um, in the past, like with me with employment discrimination, um, just more like micromanaging. Um, I, I was at a, a company that I was the only person of color. And um, I felt like everyone could kind of move, around, move about freely or have flexible schedules, but I was really, really um, under a microscope and micromanage. Um, and then also, um, you know, just not flexibility with attendance policies. And I was a um, young mom that needed childcare. Um, so just being um, a lot of a lot of times not having the type of employer that um, cared about real life happening or um, that was flexible. Um, and then I also like right now the, the uh, us working at MDRC, the type of workplace that we have, it would be really hard for me to go work somewhere else. Like thinking about the structures um, that other like employers go by and the rules and the policies. Um, MDRC has so, so many inclusive policies that um, it will be hard for me to navigate another workplace culture. Um, so that was, that's just kind of, I wanted to kind of bring about that to just kind of think about like what has our perspectives been being uh, discriminated against, um, but also just not even if we want to call it discrimination in a sense, but just some place that's not really inclusive of our whole identity. So me being a black woman, me being a mom, me having mental health disabilities where, you know, I may, I, I work differently, I need fl more flexible hours, um, you know, my focus and attention is different. <laughs> so just being more flexible in your workplace um, just creates, it, it was never that i had an issue being a great employee. Um, it was just kind of like the structures in the workplace that were just hard for me to navigate. Um, so what has employment inclusion felt like? If anyone wants to share. Has anyone type in the chat? On Hi. Mute? Sorry about not being muted earlier. <laughs> I thought I was. <laughs> Okay. Um, <laughs> that's my fault. I, I, I realized I didn't mute people upon entry. That was my bad. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, but I was trying to get my daughter, who is actually profoundly deaf, to like, hey, you need to like hop in and look at and talk. And she didn't want to talk, but I'm going to share about her. Um, she actually is a welder. Um, she's profoundly deaf. 
we actually, her teacher in high school actually called me, her deaf and hard of hearing teacher, and told me that she didn't think that that would be a good fit for her because she's deaf, because normally you hear a good when a weld is being laid well, but she actually feels it through vibration, and I was like, no, if this is what she wants to try, we're going to let her try it, and she ended up being top of the class, so fast forward, she went to um, a train school, and we actually had um, issues with interpreters, they literally threw out a ungodly price to provide interpreter services to the school. They wanted $140,000 for 10 months when in actuality my daughter only needed one hour a day and that was in the classroom. But they were worrying about me caught on fire, which my daughter doesn't need you standing next to her when she's welding, just during classroom instruction. But they couldn't get that through there. They didn't want to do it. So literally that was the low ball price was $140,000. Six different agencies, it just went up from there. So she ended up going through the program without interpreters. She used um, speech to text. Um, the school gave her all the, all the tools that they could. So they did really well. And then fast forward to the job that she has now, her employer was awesome. They actually didn't even bat an eyelash when I came with her to her um, interview. And just to like make sure that she understood what they were asking and everything. And then um, she did her welding test, that went great. Um, did the interview, wonderful. They called like next day and wanted her and she showed up to orientation and they actually had a tablet that they gave to her for communication purposes. They also gave her a key to the bathrooms because she was the only female welder in that building and normally the the door the doors don't lock like normal bathroom doors you have to have a key so they gave her a key and then like new hire i'm sorry i'm gonna say this but men mentality means that you harass the new hire and that they do it to like so they every day she come in they give her a new boy name and i told her i'm like just tell them if they keep it up that you're just gonna lock all the bathroom doors she she told them that and a week and a half later she came in and they had taken a storage room that had a utility tub and they redid the whole thing her own bathroom is the biggest bathroom it is the only one in the building that has central air and heat <laughs> so but it's been it's been a good um overall like they have really stepped up and um and they ask her questions and everything like that and so they've been really good so that's a good experience that is a great story to share thank you so much um I don't know if your daughter wants to talk about like how that felt um be, if you want to go to the next slide um <laughs> but just kind of like the the feeling of um feeling welcome feeling included um you know that's just the main thing of when we're talking about creating inclusive employment practice in an inclusive workplace so thank you again for sharing that um, so what are inclusive employee practices? Um, they are a collective of your policies, your practices, the processes, and even the work culture um, that all positively impact all of your employees. So regardless of their ability status, race, gender, sexual orientation, their religion, their background, um, work location, or any other factors, uh, creating these em employment practices that are more inclusive, they're just way more flexible and customizable to work for people with different needs and various needs. And the image is the text inclusion on the yellow background. So what are some of the benefits of creating these policies and reviewing your policies and making them more inclusive? Um, there are lower turnover rates and you'll attract more talent. So like the story that was shared. Um, she ended up being the top of her class, an excellent welder. So if you're not creating these inclusive employment practices to even be able to provide that accommodation at, in the beginning where you are providing um, 
an inclusive hiring um, process, um, you you may not you may miss out on talent, um, and also lower turnover rates. So um, if you are providing accommodations, people feel welcome. Um, they feel like they want to be more dedicated, and um, they're not more. <laughs> uh, they're not feeling more likely to quit <laughs> the <laughs> and find a different employer. Um, so better organization organizational performance when teams are diverse. So again, um, different perspectives, uh, just society as a whole is more diverse. So having that in your workplace um, just also helps with the overall performance of your organization and of your team. Um, better team performance and enhanced leadership capacity. So um, having leaders that are more diverse, they can relate, feeling more welcome and included, um, allows for better communication and attitude. So um, employees are more engaged. Um, we, we're able to give more grace to our coworkers. So also reducing that us versus them mindset where someone isn't feeling like, oh, you have a one up on me, you have a flexible schedule and I can't get that flexible schedule or thinking that they have to go through different types of hoops to have an, an accommodation. But if there's already um, inclusive practices, that's overall across the board. Everyone is being accommodated. Um, everyone is feeling included. So it just reduces that uh, mindset of feeling like you have to be against a coworker. Um, flexibility. So practices and policies uh, work across various identities. So as you're looking at your policies and creating the dip, we'll go over like examples of different policies um, and practices, but just it being more flexible, it, the policies are already in place for whoever you're hiring. So you don't have to have a unicorn or a token person that is coming in and you're like, oh my goodness, we don't have a policy around that identity. So already having these inclusive practices are just allows you to be more flexible as an employer. Um, you have definitely a better understanding of those served. So customers that are coming in, people that you're serving at your organization um, or your practice, you just have a better understanding and have more staff that can connect with that person. Um, did I miss anything? Oh, stronger brand image. So building community and partnerships, of course, um, knowing that you are an inclusive place. Um, this spreads really fast amongst the disability community if you are a place um, that is inclusive. So it just builds a stronger brand image and more trust within the community. And also professional development helps employees expand their skill sets. So um, making sure that um, professional development and opportunities to be promoted or leadership or to gain more skills is something that is across the board and not only in a set part of your work. So just to kind of reiterate, you know, employees that inclusive workplaces feel valued, included, empowered, celebrated. They feel like they can show up as their whole selves. Um, they feel comfortable, equal, supported, and welcomed. Um, and the image on the slide is of people with various identities, various disabilities, all sitting down at a table uh, with laptops and books <laughs> and appear to be working. All right, I'm gonna pass it to Tamika to talk about some of the barriers in the workplace. Yeah, so we uh, just talked about, you know, of what discrimination felt like and some of the things that, you know, that the discrimination, you know, are part of the barriers that uh, many people with disabilities face. So I'm just going to, you know, talk a little bit about, about that to put it into a perspective and provide context. Uh, there's a picture of a uh, people and there's a, a white woman sitting in a chair and she seems like she's stressing out. So, you know, really shows the barriers. So some of the challenges that people with disabilities face in the workplace is uh, discrimination. As again, we talked about a little bit earlier. Also, uh, public benefit uh, incentives. And so, um, you know, those are if you um, on, on um, government assistance or like uh, social, social security, like SSI, um, 
and you know those type of things uh, that you uh, cannot make um, a, uh, over a certain amount of earned income without those benefits um, being reduced. And so uh, that sometimes, you know, uh, have trapped people, you know, with disabilities into poverty. And so um, that is a barrier that many people with disabilities face. Also, subminimal wages is another um, barrier, those particularly with uh, developmental um, disabilities, cognitive disabilities, that they um, work in these like sheltered workshops. And so where they receive below minimal wages for the work that they do um, for companies. So uh, that is definitely um, a barrier that may be changing soon, which I'll get to on um, a later part of this presentation. Uh, so that that's, we see that as a good thing that that's changing. Um, there are also barriers to competitive integrated um, employment. So, you know, uh, you know, being in a place and they are integrating and understanding your disability um, and providing accommodations, you know, um, can be very much a barrier. And then inadequate paid leave, and paid sick policies are also, uh, you know, challenges. So, you know, people with disabilities sometimes, you know, get sick or you know, just various things. So, um, if you don't have that flexibility when it comes to um, to those different policies, pay leave and pay sick leave, then it can create a barrier. My apologies, my dog. <laughs> Just saw somebody walk past. So, uh, uh, so there. So and also, there's a um, little bit of what I shared before the previous slide. The ableism is also in is is part of the you know uh, finances and it's economic. So, you know, um, some of the challenges, again, is healthcare is linked to employment. And so if you, um, if it's Medicaid, if you, you know, again, you could lose those benefits if you, uh, you know, work over a certain amount. I know there are um, different programs, you know, that's in place. To help that. So uh, if you are, you know, looking to be employed, uh, definitely talk to, you know, Social Security office and see what kind of programs and things uh, that is out there to help you get, you know, into being employed. But, you know, that's definitely um, uh, an ableist policy. Um, again, what I said, SSI benefits, um, marriage penalty. So if those with um, two people with disabilities or even a disabled person bearing not a disabled person, that their uh, benefits will be reduced uh, substantially if they um, get married. So uh, many people do not know that, but that is definitely um, with people with disabilities is marriage inequality. Um, and then um, higher unemployment. Uh, people with disabilities are uh, at a disproportionate rate are unemployed uh, due to those factors um, than, you know, not disabled people. Um, so there is a picture of uh, different disabled people, and it says like ban sub-minimum wage, Disabled people are experts of their own lives and know what they need. Um, I shouldn't lose my benefits when I get married. And this was uh, a, a design that was created by Liberal Jane. Great design. So that's some of the um, challenges. Also, um, when it comes to actual employment, 
you know, the lack of promotion and opportunities, um, limited hours and job tasks, um, not hiring. You know, that they, I know I've spoke to many people with disabilities uh, that, you know, they could get an interview, but once they, the, the, the interviewer see, you know, their disability, then they never get called back. So um, that's, you know, really a challenge. A lack of accommodations uh, that people with disabilities are, especially those with uh, what we call like invisible disabilities. Uh, you know, people really can't see them. And so they are scared to ask for accommodations. And so uh, consequently, you know, they leave because, um, you know, they don't really, the uh, the workplace don't really provide an opportunity to request or to even accommodate uh, they, to do the accommodations. Sometimes they give them a hard time. Um, also, inaccessible job postings. Um, one of those things I've seen and that's really talked about is like those requirements of you can't pick up, um, you can't work here if you can't pick up 25 pounds or stand on your feet, you know, certain amount of hours. And when in reality, that job really does not require to pick up 25 pounds. So, you know, inaccessible job postings uh, or not able to see or not, you know, provided a statement, you know, that kind of, you know, have, make people with disabilities think that they're not welcome there. And so um, all those different factors um, that I just mentioned creates unwelcoming work culture. And so um, that's that's not not good, of course. Um, so there's ways we can, you know, disrupt all these things that I just mentioned, and that is to um, end occupational segregation. Um, it was a term um, that was coined, uh, well, I read it from the nationalpartnership.org. Um, and so in, in a nutshell, uh, occupational segregation is when as people with disabilities are, you know, leaving high school or whatever, you know, going into the workforce, that a lot of times you are uh, funneled into certain types of jobs. And so, uh, you know, you're not really encouraged to be like a nurse or to be a doctor or to be a lawyer. You know, you're more segregated to, you know, be maybe a secretary or work in an office job or, you know, say those type of things. So, um, and it's not really based upon the physical ability of why they can't do the job. It's more due to the social, um, I would say, understanding or the social pressures of society thinking that they're not able to do the job. Um, and so uh, people with disabilities and also women um, ex have experienced that uh, as well as, you know, people of color, too. Um, and so we need to increase fellowship, mentorship, apprenticeships, programs that actively recruiting people with disabilities to higher paid jobs. So when it comes to things like STEM, um, the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, um, that, you know, we need more people with disabilities involved in that. Um, also, to end the page wage gap within the same occupation, uh, people with disabilities and women with disabilities, um, you know, experience a uh, page wage gap even among, you know, disabled people. So uh, that needs to end and then to raise the income ceiling for those who need to keep their medical benefits um, and end sheltered workshops. And so uh, let's see if I could put this link in the chat, you know, or I'll definitely send it uh, with uh, 
after this presentation so you can look at the article. Uh, but there's different ways that we can, uh, you know, disrupt uh, ableist employment practices. Now give it to H and A to talk about display justice in the workplace. Uh, Tamika, I think you were going to do these ones and oh. then I'll do the toolkit. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Reverse that. I'm so, going to get that uh, link for you, though. Yeah, thank you. Um, and so, you know, display justice in the workplace is uh, one of the frameworks that, you know, we feel bring about true inclusion. And so disability justice is, in a nutshell, is is a framework uh, that I personally um, use is that we uh, integrate, you know, the experiences of, of course, you know, people with disabilities, but all of, of you know, people of color, you know, for people who uh, immigrants, uh, people are, you know, part of the LGBTQ community. And so when we advocate for changes, we advocate for people of multiple identities um, within and without the disability community. So we're definitely connected to uh, the movements and, um, and you know, that, that we see uh, going on. And so, uh, you know, with disability justice, how that works in the workplace, how can you create a culture where, you know, people with multiple identities can feel like they belong and, and not just integrate, but feel like they belong. Uh, yeah. That's the way, you know, we kind of, we see, you know, the world. So disability justice, again, is about creating a culture where people feel like they belong and including all phases yeah. of the organization. Um, there are 10 principles um, you could go to um, sins invalid uh, to to uh, see the the ten principles of disability justice. But one of those is about um, about you know being anti capitalist and not putting profit over bodies uh, because sometimes you know in this work culture we work people to the bone per se so it's about you know not putting profits over bodies um, allowing self-care and better work and life balance which is important um, also it's been about providing job accommodation and access needs and the the and the what with disability justice that that is the ownership of providing those things is not on the disabled employee, but it's on the employer. So, um, so the employer making sure they offer, you know, job accommodation, you know, uh, making sure, you know, when they send emails, say, you know, if you have access need or, you know, if you need, you know, anything, uh, you know, let us know. So, and then having vendors, you know, available uh, to provide that accommodation and that access need. And so, um, again, it's not on the barrier. The the ownership is not on the disabled person, but it's on the employer. Um, and then also create a system that elevates people with disabilities into leadership roles. And so, um, you know, that is very much important um, to see disabled people and create a system that they can be promoted. Um, so one of the principles actually within disability justice is um, intersectionality. And so the acknowledge that uh, all of your employees um, identity, so that's ability, status, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, immigration status. And so it's really uh, acknowledging that disabled people are not monolith, you know, we are, uh, you know, are in all places, you know, all groups, demographics. 
And so um, it's just understanding that and it's celebrating, you know, the diversity of people. And so um, there's a picture here of the intersectionality, will of power and privilege. So it just goes into the different demographics and um, uh, different identities and, uh, you know, and it goes into the the power and the privilege and what that looks like. And here it goes, you know, again, so you see those uh, that's closer to the power, you know, like English, American citizen, post-secondary degree, white, no support me, not disabled, neurotypical, cis, straight, um, high wealth income, own a home. So those those are you know closest to having power. And then it goes out uh to those who have less power. No. Uh, so, all right. That is my justice toolkit. All right. So um, when you are thinking about, um, like, where do I start? Um, how do I get uh, my organization to start this process of being more inclusive? Um, I don't even know exactly, like, should we start with policy? Should we start with work culture? Like, where do I start? So this disability justice um, and audit tool, this toolkit um, was created by disability justice advocates. Um, and the, the toolkit was aimed to help BIPOC-led organizations, so um, organizations that are not primarily focused around disability, helping them be able to assess, you know, where they're at right now, the things, how um, they're utilizing the disab disability justice framework in um, creating their policies, the politics, the things that they are um, rallying around or supporting, um, their their uh, internal work culture, the ways that they're serving um, their clients or customers or you know just people in the community in general, they're a public service um, organization. So it the toolkit includes questions, self-assessment, surveys, evaluations, um, and links to other access tools, and also provides some other organizational stories on how they utilize the toolkit and the ways that they are um, implementing change. Um, and there's a, just a lot of different things. I will put um, the link to this toolkit, it is free, um, it is available. They also, if you go to the next slide, um, they have plain language, it's very accessible. They have plain language text of this toolkit. They have um, images um, for those that are more visual learners like me. <laughs> um, so something that uh, it walks you through and has more worksheets, um, different activities, if, you know, just to make this not just like more of a when we say audit, I know a lot of people kind of glaze over, like where it's like, oh man, we got to do all this talking or reading, um, but they have put it in different formats. So it's a really nice tool to use um, for your organization to even just get a starting place on the questions to ask, the things to reflect on, and um, really like just talk, just evaluating like where you're at when it comes to being more inclusive of people with disabilities. So on this screen is an image of, um, uh, insert from the workbook. So an internal disability justice audit, audit, I won't read all of this, but I'll just read some of the questions that they uh, ask inside of the toolkit. Um, so do we have a list of access support vendors? So Tamika talked about having that list of vendors already available and ready. So if someone does need an accommodation, that's something that you already have, you've already thought about, you're mindful. Um, it's not going to delay the process of hiring someone or someone start um, start date because you need to find an accommodation for them. You already have a list of people or you have a list of um, just someone that you, a list of people that you can consult with on how to navigate getting that accommodation. So um, shameless plug here, <laughs> the Michigan Disability Rights Coalition, you know, this is part of our uh, funding and our work that we do is we do, you know, consult with people and provide information and training on being more inclusive. And then we also have our assistive technology program that is free and we provide assistive technology for um, the workplace as well and for employment. 
So in a long list of different AT devices for all of uh, everyone's needs. Um, but just having that stuff available um, is great. And then another question that the workbook talks about is um, how many people with disabilities are in our group? Are any of them leaders? So taking the time to really evaluate are, um, do we even have anyone on our team that has a disability? Have we ever hired anyone with a disability? Um, okay, we've had a couple people that have disabilities, but have they ever been promoted into leadership? Um, why or why not? You know, like what are some barriers that they may be facing to not be in leadership or have we not presented them with the opportunities? So it really just um, walks you through, you know, asking those, those questions and really reflecting as an org um, are, on how you're being inclusive of people with disabilities. And again, um, so with Tamika talking about intersectionality, the workbook um, also asks you questions on how you're embodying intersectionality in your work. Um, how are you making sure that BIPOC, queer, trans folks, the not men and the working class poor are part of your work? And how do you take leadership from and support the leadership of people targeted by multiple interlocking oppressions? So again, acknowledging the various identities of your staff, um, how you're taking on um, and supporting um, those people as well. And the image on the slide is of three people with disabilities. They are wearing a pride flag. Um, and one person is in a wheelchair and one person is using a cane. So we really want to um, implement that. You want to look at the disability justice framework and have this implemented in the work that you're doing and ongoing from the start. So how are we already talking about this framework um, and utilizing that framework when we're thinking about the changes that we're going to make internally with our policies and our work culture. So um, another question from the toolkit is how is disability justice influencing our politics and practices. Great, so I'm going to open it up to the audience again, um, if anyone wants to share. Um, what are some ways that you've seen um, employers create an inclusive workplace? If you want to unmute or type in the chat. Tamika, you're the expert, but I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit if you want to name a, a good policy or something that you've seen um, employers do or something that you're working on the cohort members with, um, you know, some of their goals. Yeah, so um, an inclusive practice is, which is one of the biggest was, it's like a lot of people have, organization have events and so um you know how do we create an event that disabled people will you know for one will come to you know and they feel you know welcomed uh into uh the space because you know even just myself it's like you know, as a person with a physical disability you know you see like different great events in the community but a lot of times you do think about like, is the, and it still happens to, you know, today, like, is this place accessible? Like, is there steps or, you know, uh, I know I've been just recently um, attend um, an event and the space was um, accessible, but where the people were at, you know, was on like a, uh, like a platform. So it was a big, step you know in order to get on the platform where everybody was sitting well and so I had to just be kind of like to the side and so you know it's like yeah the place is accessible but the where people are sitting is it you know so it makes right. it really awkward and things like that so you know just making sure you know um when you have events that you know is 
thinking about the space and, you know, is it accessible for people with disabilities to get around? Do you have ASL interpreters or do you provide um, accommodations? You know, a statement about accommodations on the, you know, marketing material and advertisement so disabled people can let you know, you know, that they, they're going to need those type of accommodations. That's, you know, those are things that many organizations are not doing. Yes. And so it's not only when we're talking about events, um, you know, when you um, having events that are already inclusive. So um, when you are doing public events, making sure that they're accessible, but also when you're having um, internal staff events, like making sure that those are accessible too for all of your staff, not being like, oh, this one person could just sit this one out, we'll do something next time or we'll catch you later. Um, but just making sure, again, like from the very beginning, we're being mindful of um, our staff, the people that we serve, um, and their various identities. So when you're thinking about creating an inclusive um, workplace, so first of all, we have to establish that buy-in, right? A, um, commitment has to come from leadership. Um, and then also talking about accessibility, your outreach um, practices and advertising, hiring practices, employment practices, so the policies that you all are creating in the work culture, and then also your community and um, allyship to the community. So the partners that you're having, um, the relationships that you're building, and then also even evaluating internally, and then getting feedback from others as well. All right, the main step, I keep thinking that I'm sharing the screen, I'm sorry. Uh, so when we're talking about establishing buy-in um, and committing to inclusion, so first we wanna identify the change that we would like to see. So that's a good place to, um, because this all could be an overwhelming change, right? For an organization, um, leadership wants to talk about costs, um, what is this going to look like capacity wise? How much time are we going to have to put in? What are we really going to invest? Um, or how much are we going to have to invest? So really identifying first, like what exactly is the problem that we want to see? Um, and then kind of taking it in steps from there. So um, we do leadership has to commit to this change. So if leadership isn't on board with this, staff are just going to have a hard time trying to implement certain things. Even if you have a good supervisor, but the director isn't all in, all the way involved, or the CEO is not involved, or the board isn't fully on, fully committed, um, things just get lost and missed. So you just want to make sure that leadership is committing to this. And then also just um, realizing that as staff members and as employee empl employees, you have a power of influence. So attending a session like this and then bringing it to your leadership or saying like, hey, you know, we should be more inclusive because of X, Y, Z, these type of things. Um, or, you know, I identify as a person with a disability. I learned a lot about this and I feel like we could change a policy in this way. So really not thinking like, okay, I'm not in leadership. They'll never listen to me, but realizing that you have a lot of power and influence as an employee as well. Um, and then seeking input from the most impacted. So seeking that input from the staff, seeking the input from people that are part of this disability community and other marginalized communities on ways that you can be more inclusive um, in, internally and to the communities that you're serving. And just, uh, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> review and evaluate. So reviewing your policies, evaluating, you know, surveys within the staff, um, you know, creating that culture where people feel safe and um, feel um, welcome to uh, share um, stories or share their experiences or give feedback. Um, and then remembering that the work is ongoing. So this is a, a ongoing cycle. Um, change is just not gonna happen overnight. You might identify one problem and then realize there's some other things that you need to change. Um, so the work is ongoing. Next slide. So next we're gonna talk about accessibility. Oh, I'm sorry, the image on the slide is of a bunch of different accessibility icons. So sign language icon, hard of hearing, uh, wheelchair access, closed captions. So when we're thinking about those events, again, what Tamika said, uh, when we plan a campaign or action or an event, how are we thinking about disabled people and issues as we do our work? Are we thinking about disability from the beginning or going oops and remembering it at the end? 
And again, this is another question and prompt from the toolkit. So what is um, inclusive and in being inclusive um, when it comes to accessibility and accommodation. So that means the physical inclusion and accessibility, um, you know, making sure there's no barriers within the workplace. Uh, like Tamika said, there's ramps, there's, uh, there's access um, to the workplace. So another thing that some employers don't even think about is when their location is not on a bus line. Um, so that provides another barrier too with transportation um, and other physical access, or if it is on a bus line, but there's a dirt road to get up to your building. Um, so there's just different things to think about um, physically when we're talking about inclusion and accessibility, um, digital inclusion. So a lot of our job postings, a lot of the work that we're doing is online. So making sure that those things are accessible. So screen reader, um, there's not a lot of like pop-ups and um, their uh, graphic design and not busy, there aren't busy backgrounds. Um, so those type of things, thinking about that when you're creating posts, advertising um, and providing accommodations for people with both apparent and non-apparent disabilities. So also thinking about mental health disabilities and people that are neurodivergent, uh, people that have sensory um, processing disorders. So things that are not apparent um, and then also thinking about plain language um, for those that have learning and developmental disabilities, um, so just providing different accommodations for that. And then again, uh, assistive technology for work, um, having those type of devices either on hand or knowing how to receive them or where to buy them from, um, or just having a, even a little bit of knowledge of the type of access, uh, assistive technology devices that are out there to help with the type of job tasks that people will be doing at your workplace. Um, being more flexible with hybrid and fully remote work options, more PTO and flexible attendance policies, and uh, our accessible social events. And the image on the screen is of an icon of a screen reader on a um, computer screen. So just going more into advertising. So when we're talking about being more inclusive when you are promoting um, things for your um, company. So inclusive verbiage and imagery, um, targeted advertising. So promoting um, things in places that people with disabilities are actually going to engage with the post and see the post um, and connect with them. And um, also, so connecting and partnering with state and local disability um, agencies that could share your, share your post, um, make sure that people are actually attending your events or that they're going to apply. Um, so really uh, making sure that you're targeting um, the disability community and uh, posting open, open positions to the website that target disabled applicants as well. All right, Tamika, you wanna talk about outreach a little bit more? Yeah, so when it comes to outreach, you know, when, it, when you're looking for uh, more, uh, looking for employees with, you know, disabilities, uh, or, you know, even again with events is um, including people with disabilities um, in your marketing uh, materials. And so um, that goes back to, you know, a little bit more with um, advertising uh, because then people with disabilities will see themselves. Um, and so they're like, okay, this place is, you know, for me. I can work here because I see them, um, you know, post posting and see these disabled people there. Um, also, work with disabled owned companies on marketing and outreach. Uh, you know, there are uh, different uh, disabled owned companies um, that exist and that this is, you know, what they do. So, uh, working with them on, um, Recruiting and, uh, and, and, and and marketing, also part of with nonprofits to help reach the audience. So you know, if you're looking to recruit more disabled people, uh, there are vocational rehabs um, that um, exist. You know, within each state. Uh, here in Michigan, we call it uh, Michigan Rehabilitation Services. 
And so, um, you know, you can partner with them. Uh, there are other um, employment type of agencies, uh, nonprofits that uh, have disabled people that's ready to work. So, um, you know, partner with them. Also going to colleges, uh, you know, every pretty much many colleges have disability offices they're supposed to at least. So, uh, you know, going and providing job postings and, you know, internship opportunities and things like that to where, uh, you know, disabled people are, you know, on college campuses and stuff. So uh, those are just, you know, some of the ideas to do outreach. Um, this is a, um, it says clubmates travel, and it's a travel for people with disabilities. And so it's just, it's just uh, different pi pictures interchangeably, uh, well, different pictures of disabled people changing within the, the graphic. Um, hiring, recruiting uh, processes. So, uh, you know, accessible job postings uh, as we um, have shared before earlier in this presentation. Um, and then uh, also outreach and networking with partner disability community, uh, job descriptions um, as shared before, um, you know, make sure it's actually accurate to the job, not just taking a template <laughs> that was created back in, you know, 1999 and, <laughs> and say, okay, here's the, this is a little bit of what we need. And then, you know, post it. You got actually, you know, be, uh, uh, you know, to the job and, uh, and then, uh, you know, providing um, accommodations during the hiring practices is that that's important. Um, so here are some uh, examples of, uh, of a statement that you can use when it comes to uh, uh, job, like a job posting. So um, you can say, and it says here on the slide, at uh, such and such, you know, company, we strive to create an accessible and inclusive application and selection process. We are committed to working with and providing reasonable uh, accommodation to job applicants who may require provisions to participate in the recruitment, selection, and or assessment process. Should you require an accommodation, please contact our talent acquisition team by email at or phone at, and we will work with you to meet your accessibility needs. This, this definitely is, you know, a, a game changer. I personally have not seen this on many uh, uh, job, you know, postings. So, or, you know, even on the company's website. So this is, you know, something that you definitely, I would encourage, you know, employers to use. Uh, so again, people disabled will see themselves um, and know that they belong there. Um, there's a picture of an uh, African-American man in a wheelchair shaking the head of, of uh, the person he that's interviewing him. And this was from data people. I think I also want to add um, when we're talking about hiring and um, creating those statements within the um, application and the job postings, um, it makes people feel more comfortable to disclose because they already feel welcome because they saw that, that you're going to provide the accommodation. Um, the, that you are taking the time out to say like we welcome people uh, with disabilities and encourage them to apply. Um, also, just kind of the things that we do internally um, too, like we provide um, our questions in advance. Um, that is helpful for people that are neurodiverse. 
neurodiverse that um, divergent, I'm sorry, that um, need that assistance or have may have intellectual learning disabilities. Um, and then uh, we also, if there, if uh, we are having a an interview on Zoom, we say the questions um, verbally, and then we also put them in the chat um, so that if someone um, needs to also see the question, it helps them as well. So thinking about just those type of things, like even in your interview process and your interview style on being more inclusive in the beginning. Exactly, exactly. Um, and so, you know, this is the thing to think about, you know, as far as with, you know, changing, uh, you know, the way you do, employer uh, you do the business is to think, you know, uh, are we thinking of disabled people as leaders and members of our organization or just as clients to be served? Um, I know that within, you know, even um, sometimes within uh, disability organizations, Sometimes, you know, the people who's running it, uh, the executives, and, you know, they really don't, they don't have a disability. So, uh, you know, so it's that kind of goes to the, to the terminology that, you know, um, that people, you know, with disabled, disabled people should be seen as leaders, you know, and as members, not just clients or consumers that I've heard, you know the term being used. So that is, you know, a question that um, as an employer and as an employee that you can bring up to, to you know, businesses and, you know, to the people that you work for. Um, so as far as with employment practices, um, is the, are these inclusive policies policies written, you know, and to be followed by future employees regardless of manager changes. And so, uh, you know, that is uh, very important because, you know, if you don't have the policies written down in your handbook, then, you know, uh, the person who's writing at the time, you know, say, oh yeah, this is great. Let's institute these policies, but if they retire or, you know, move on, then it changes because it's not written down. Um, having an inclusive board um, is important as well because they, the board, you know, steers the organization. So having the inclusive board, opportunities and positions of leadership and power for people with disabilities. And having inclusive holidays, I know we have, you know, various, um, you know, different holidays at times, so in celebration, so including um, ADA Day, which we have here at FDRC, uh, which is, I think, July 26. Um, you know, that's, that's something that you could uh, do at your employment, you know, employ, uh, you know, at the job, um, you know, and if you don't have the day off, at least celebrate it and acknowledge it, you know, is a good step as well. And there is a picture of three African-Americans, one woman, two men, I'm standing around in the office. And there's another uh, man too, to the side. Uh, no, Adrian, are you supposed to take this or take it to you? Sure. <laughs> so um, I do want to acknowledge that it is 106, and I know that some people have to leave like during the lunch hour at one. Um, so I did put our survey and evaluation form in the chat. We do uh, welcome your feedback and really appreciate um, hearing from you all on how you thought the session went. Um, so we're going to continue with talking about uh, implementing employment practices by uh, creating a welcome and belonging work culture. So creating committees and groups that um, are 
you know, specifically for um, people with disabilities um, and um, making sure they have a space and uh, you're creating that necessary space for them to be able to talk about or um, talk about challenges or barriers, talk about, give feedback on what's going on within the workplace um, from people that they're connecting with and that they identify with. Um, so creating those type of groups that's really focused on um, specific identities. Um, we have a lot of people that talk about, you know, their DEI work and how they create um, these different committees and groups for race, gender, sexual orientation, but we don't hear a lot about people creating um, those groups that really help in our focus on disabilities. So we would love to see more of that <laughs> within workplace culture. Um, when we're talking about language, so learning to speak inclusively. So, um, you know, we talked about using plain language for people that are neurodiverse or that have different intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, also using thriving language. So uh, language that uh, the person with the disability has said that they like to be identified as. So if they choose um, identity first, so I'm a person, um, well, I'm an autistic person, or if they choose uh, to identify as a person with autism, utilizing that language. Um, and also, if you if someone is saying that a word or a term that you're using is offensive, acknowledging that and, um, you know, be mindful of the language that we're using. Um, so trainings like this, staff awareness training centered on marginalized communities, so cultural competence, inclusive um, DEI, you know, different trainings and staff awareness trainings about disability um, are great to implement um, a welcoming belonging work culture. Um, and, you know, do, doing all of this creates feeling, uh, feelings of being welcome and belonging in the workplace. So we, we uh, went through and we kind of, uh, took out a couple of, did some research on different policies that address, um, you know, race, I, other identities like your sexual orientation, um, different policies that address violence. Um, due to time, we won't be able to go through all of these, but we did want to um, give examples of what an inclusive practice would look like and being mindful of the intersections of your staff. Um, so, uh, strict, having strict policies on racial and ethnic discrimination, um, thinking about diversity training programs, um, establishing a company-wide mentoring program, and again, those committees and groups, so employee resource groups, um, ERGs, um, and then, you know, acknowledging cultural holidays. So, um, you know, recently, Juneteenth, um, has been passed where people are now acknowledging Juneteenth and taking that day off. Um, and then also we would love for people to acknowledge uh, ADA Day, like I said. Um, different policies that address gender identity. So include gender identity and expression as a protected category. Uh, provide trainings and educational opportunities for your staff. This is really important. Um, we, our, our work culture is that we are very inclusive, but we still learn a lot when it comes to gender identity and sexual orientation. Um, so I believe that, you know, just having that overall um, uh, training and then, you know, just establishing that this is uh, something that policies regarding like facility usage usage and non-discriminatory non -discriminatory, um, terms. Um, and then, uh, you know, also health insurance policies and just things like that internally. But cre again, creating that work culture where someone will feel more welcome and like they belong when you're actually educating your staff on um, how to navigate spaces with your coworkers, other identities. And then there's uh, different policies that address violence. So um, training people on how to uh, how to uh, respond to violence or things that are happening um, at the workplace. Um, confidentiality for victimized employees. Um, uh, different accommodations. 
And um, also, again, when someone um, going through a traumatic experience and experiencing violence, uh, we spend so much time at work that it does, it's not realistic to expect someone to mask and to throw, to um, kind of just disregard things that are, that may be happening outside of the workplace. So I know sometimes there's pushback on these type of things um, when we're talking about workplace policies, but we spend so much time at work um you know there's other things that real life is happening where you know again that per, coming to work as your whole self um is very important so be already feeling like you can go to your employer and disclose and let them know like hey i'm going through this hard time um and not feeling like this would affect your job but there's already processes in place to help you feel supported Is this me too? Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, community and allyship. Um, so when we're talking about building connections and um, relationships, um, again, just reiterating that targeted advertising, representing people with disabilities in your advertising, um, establishing relationships with the disability community. If you have caused harm in the past or have not been the most accessible or, you know, you know that you um, have not been inclusive, mending those relationships, acknowledging that you've caused harm and talking about how we're, we're moving forward and committed to making change. Uh, th using thriving language, creating those spaces for welcome and belonging. And um, when we're talking about staff awareness, also realizing that, um, realizing and acknowledging your privileges so that uh, part that Tamika had that talks about where you're at in power and privilege, realizing that you have privilege to amplify voices of people with disabilities and leveraging that um, to disrupt ableism, talk to, talking to people um, and um, ra just raising more awareness about the disability community and how to be anti-ableist. And then just, you know, the commitment to the change and commitment to being an ally. Okay, I can do this. So with um, allyship is to, you know, thinking about, you know, how are we addressing and mending histories of ableism in our culture and build and building with disabled communities and organizations. Uh, so this is from uh, the page 16 of the Disability Justice Audit uh, Toolkit. And so um, I think this question is, of course, you know, important because, um, you know, just like with any place of employment, um, um, any place, if you um, have a, you know, this, if you create a toxic work environment for anybody, you know, um, you know, that the word gets around you know, to, to to people and like, okay, you don't want to work at XYZ or you don't want to, you know, support XYZ because this is what they do to their, you know, employees. And so, uh, or this is how, you know, they treat their customers. And so, um, you know, so the same thing applies to, you know, disabled people. And like, so we know which places, you know, may not go and, you know, may not be the best place to work for. So it's, you know, um, acknowledging that if you are getting, you know, start getting pushed back um, or when you take surveys or whatever, and you see, you know, a lot of pushback, then it's like, okay, what this is, you know, kind of how we're treating people and so um you know that's where you could go to a disabled uh disability community organizations like okay how can we change it how can we create a better um, environment to change our culture because this is the best for you know the company to do that because if you know cases if you discriminate then you open it open um, yourself to, you know, a lawsuit. So, um, you know, addressing those 
um, issues is very important. And then also to become an ally. Then there's um, evaluations and feedback. Uh, AJ, did you want to take this? Sure. Um, so when we're talking about evaluation and feedback, it's not just from people outside of the organization, also really thinking about um, internal evaluation. So what are we, what are we doing um, internally as an org um, to be inclusive? And that, I've, that has to start first before we can even talk about being more inclusive to people that are outside of our organization. So if we're like, oh yeah, we want everyone to feel welcome when they're coming to our events, but then you have the people that are staffing the events that are like, I don't even feel like my employer values uh, me as my whole self. Um, so the work really has to start within. So doing those internal evaluations um, at the in within the workplace, um, using the audit toolkits that we talked about. There's other um, toolkits for uh, disabilities um, that are available online as well. Um, hearing from your staff, so creating surveys, um, you know, talking about, uh, I'm sorry, asking questions about um, the type of culture and the policies. Um, also, uh, with disabilities, things change. So if you're not doing these, um, you know, maybe annually, um, you may not even realize that some of your staff now have a disability that did not have a disability when they were hired. Um, so there's different things that can happen that you want to just continue to take the time to evaluate and um, review like what's going on within. And then um, reviewing the policies and then making updates. So a lot of times <laughs> when we work with certain groups, um, they have not updated their policies in years, like over a decade sometimes where they have not even, um, they may be like a smaller org where it just wasn't really necessary. Or again, they may not have ever had someone that needed um, to update the policy or that it really um, pertain, a policy pertained to them. Um, so reviewing your policies and making updates and continuing to just think about ways that your policies can already just be inclusive where that has doesn't have to be a change when you do hire someone. Um, do you offer surveys after events or after a service has been provided? So yes, yeah, so thinking about things um, on the outside too. So the communities that you're serving, um, are they able to provide feedback? Um, and do you have a process for reviewing and incorporating the feedback that you receive? So after you collect all these surveys and you have all this data, you have everything um, that gives the feedback, now what are you going to do with it? So really coming up, you can go to the next slide, um, really coming up with like processes on how you're actually going to um, evaluate and um, creating those evaluation measures and reviewing the feedback and then how you're going to implement that. So um, developing an evaluate, evaluation measure in a timely process for reviewing the feedback. So sometimes it may be like, okay, we got this feedback months ago, we haven't even had the capacity to review it. So that should already be a part of the process when you're thinking of um, evaluations, like when are we going to review it? Um, what are, how are we setting up a team that is going to actually implement these and talk about um, the changes that need to to happen. Um, also with accessible, I'm sorry, with evaluations and forms that you're providing to the public or even internally, um, making sure that they are accessible. So um, offering a telephone number for someone to call to give feedback. Um, some, some people are not using the internet. Um, some people have a hard time writing um, things or have a hard time typing things out. Um, so making sure that you're hearing you know, all voices um, and getting feedback from everyone's. Um, also an email that is um, accessible and working um, that people can share their experiences. Um, and when you, after you uh, collect everything, so utilizing the feedback and making changes that, I'm sorry, you using your feedback <laughs> and making these changes, they build the community and build your trust within the community. So if I attended an event that wasn't the most accessible last year, and then I see that you have um, made those changes the next year, like that's going to build my trust in you that, oh, they're actually committed to this. They're listening to what we're saying. Um, and they're in the 
data and the evaluation just didn't go um, nowhere. Like, you know, it actually me taking the time to review and give them their feedback, they listened and paid attention. Um, and again, just acknowledging any harm that has been caused um, and, you know, talking about ways to, to move forward. So the quote on the screen is, do the best that you can until you know better. And then when you know better, do better. By Maya Angelou. So, um, so what can you do to be anti-ableist? So, you know, this is anyone um, can do these things and advocate um, and work towards uh, being anti-ableist. And so that means um, to actively working to dismantle ableism. It begins with recognizing that ableism exists and that it causes serious harm and that non-disabled people benefit from this system. This is known as privilege. Um, so just like in being anti-racist, um, you know, same things that uh, similar to that implies, um, uh, non-disabled people do not need to think about accessibility or worry about facing ableist discrimination. You know, when it comes to um, ability, uh, others may be more likely to respect non-disabled people or promote them to positions of power. A person or group of people can use this privilege to help, you know, disabled um, to help to help disabled people and to help others. So if you know, you know, the example of this, if you in this space, you know, as a not disabled person, um, you know, there's thinking like, who, how can I bring, you know, not disabled, how can I bring disabled people into this room? Or how can I bring other people into this room so they are afforded the same opportunity as I? So that's, that's an example of, you know, using uh, privilege. There's a picture here with um, various people and two of them um, have the, uh, physical disabilities and they are happy. Um, so some ways you can begin to practice anti-ableism is learning about the disability, what it means, and how it affects people. So, you know, you have to be like a full-fledged expert, but, um, you know, having understanding like basic, you know, disability and um, what that means. Learn about ableism, learn about stereotypes, um, learn about the history of disability rights activism, listening to people with disabilities, share their experiences, challenging ableism as it happens. So correcting, if you hear something that you know is not correct, um, you know, speaking out or stop the bullying, giving people with disabilities a platform. So, you know, passing the mic instead of speaking for them, um, having kitty for accessibility and, and inclusivity and enabling policies and laws in the workplace, and even legislatively, um, that counters ableism. And so this is a call to action that, you know, we, we can do as um, employees, and then also what employers can do to, so, you know, respect people with disabilities and their decisions, you know, just be conscious of, you know, your actions and words, even thoughts like, so if you know uh, somebody breaks up to you, as we shared before, that that's kind of offensive, or I don't like those jokes, or, you know what I'm saying, those type of things. It's like, okay, like, you know, just be cognizant and, and, and conscious of it. Uh, call out ableism when it happens and make it clear that it's okay, it's now okay, uh, promote accessibility. So just, you know, when you go to places or you see as the employer, okay, this is not accessible, you know, um, 
talking about that. Um, hold organizations, especially politicians, accountable, um, fight for inclusive society that respects and safe and accessible, you know, for, for everyone. Um, also, this is what I shared before I was going to talk about, um, but there is um, a sub-minimal wage that has um, that occurs for people with developmental disabilities, and um, and they, they're uh, the the Biden and Harris administration is uh, has actually um, put out a thing to to ban it, you know, from from occurring to propose that, and so uh, that's under the Section fourteen C of the Fair Labor Standards Act. And so um, in Michigan, there is um, a survey that is being, um, you know, have been sent out for people with disabilities to take to get their input so that Michigan will be prepared to, um, to, to, you know, implement it, you know, if it, if it um, gets um, certified. So um, uh, that you will get the link up to that if you wish to take the survey. And then also to continue to watch movies and documentaries to learn more about workplace and things that people with disabilities go through, um, even the economics of those things. Um, so there's a, a documentary that's coming on Hulu called Patrice, which follows um, a couple uh, but, but particularly a woman named Patrice uh, that has a developmental disability and she's fighting for her right to not lose her benefits when she um, what marries her partner. And so um, that is a really great documentary. I think it comes out on Monday, September 30th on Hulu. So uh, those are some things that you can do. All right. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, again, please fill out our evaluation form um, if you would like to reach out to the lead-in program. Um, we do provide trainings to organizations, um, and uh, you can email us um, to schedule a, a training. So info, I-N-F-O, at mymdrc.org. Um, next slide. Um, you can reach uh, me and Tamika individually. So Tamika's email is Tamika at mymdrc.org. And my email is a Thomas at mymdrc.org. Also follow us on Facebook to stay connected, um, facebook.com slash mymdrc. And also our YouTube channel has a lot of different trainings um, on, on our channel. Um, and our YouTube channel can be found uh, with the username at my dis rights. So M I dis rights um, is our username on YouTube. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments um, before we go? No. There was nothing in the chat. Well, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. And thank you, Amy, for sharing your story um, and experience with us. We appreciate that. Um, if there isn't anything else, um, thank you to our interpreters um, today and also our card captioner. We appreciate you all for spending the time with us. Yes, thank you. Thank you to our chat moderator, Pris Priscilla. Uh, Amy said, thanks, Asian and Tamika, for presenting and to participants for sharing. Thank you. Hi. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.
Okay, I ended the stream. Now we just need to stop recording.